related rates. What we're talking about in related rates is how to relate a formula to its change according to time. It's change according to time. Um, for instance, how is cost changing according to time? How is profit changing according to time? How is a volume of something that's expanding or shrinking changing according to time? So uh, how, what's the volume doing at exactly three seconds? Is it expanding? Is it uh, decreasing? At what rate is it doing that? That's what we're talking about here. Does that make sense to you? So I'll, be, I'll give you like an introduction here. This is basically relating a formula with time. That's what related rates mean for us. Relating a formula with time. Here's an example. We're not going to work all the way through this example. I just want to give you the idea on what's happening here. And, and then we'll start with some simpler ones. I'm going to start, it's kind of weird. I'm going to start you off with one of the harder examples. And then we'll make it easier. Okay, just so you see the idea first. Let's say that I have this cone. That's my cone here. And what I'm doing is this cone is underneath a, a faucet. It's my faucet. Okay, and, and water's coming out of it. It fills it up to a certain level, and then we take and we cut the cone right there so the water starts coming out. So maybe this is like a, uh, some sort of a, a water container for a city. A huge cone, usually they're, they're probably cylinders, but let's just pretend it's a cone. It's the same idea would apply for a cylinder. But it's, it's going to fill it up to a certain level, and once it gets to that level, maybe it opens up. And that's our idea for this, this idea, or for, for this related rates problem. So after a while, I'm going to have some sort of a level of water here. True? <laughs> and of course that water is going to be, as soon as I open up this spot, I, I shut this off, I open up this bottom and start leaking out. So probably pretty fast at first, whatever, whatever that takes place, it's going to be leaking out somewhere. Now, our cone has a couple of dimensions to it. What do you need to know to find the volume of a cone? Because we're going to talk about volume here in just a little bit. Uh, okay, we do need a height of the cone. I heard height first. Yes, that's a height. And the radius of the cone is probably pretty important. So you got height and radius. What I want to do is find the rate of change of the volume of the water with respect to time. I know that's a, it's a horrible sounding question, right? Find the rate of change of the volume of the water with respect to time. That's our idea. Well, here's our issue. Um, does the water fill the whole cone up? So that H and that R, if you think about this, the H and the R stood for the whole cone, right? If it were filled up, that would be the, the water's H and R as well. However, as we lose water, what's happening to the H? It's getting sure, and the R is also decreasing as well, right? So at certain times, this is going to have different radiuses and different heights and therefore a different volume of water. So we're going to be able to, I'm going to show you how to do this, we're going to be able to find out uh, how this volume of water is changing at any given moment in time. So here's what, what you need to do. The first thing is find a formula that relates what you want to talk about. So basically, what are we talking about? The rate of change of what? So we need a volume. So we need to know the volume of a cone first. So it starts out quite <coughs> easy. It says, find me the volume of a cone. Now, do you know the volume of a cone? Do you know the volume of a cylinder? Oh boy. <laughs> Do you know the area of a circle? Oh good, okay, let's start there. That's the area of a circle, right? 
Notice that a cylinder is just a whole bunch of circles stacked on top of each other for however much the height is. So uh, area, surface area of a circle is pi r squared, therefore the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times the height. To find the volume of a cone, you cut that in thirds. So it's one third pi r squared inch. Or pi over three r squared inch. Now here's the deal. Um, this relates what we want it to relate. Look at the board. It relates volume with the radius and the height. That's all of our measurements up here. Are you, are you agreed on that? You got to have that for a related rate problem. But the the other problem is, is there any time anywhere? Now here's how we're going to use implicit differentiation to our advantage. You can take a derivative of this equation with respect to any variable that you really want to. Now some of them will make sense, but we're going to take it with respect to time. So we're going to implicitly derive this formula with respect to time, because that's what the related rate does, is with respect to time. So find a derivative with respect to time. Implicitly. Why can we do this? Why is this allowed for us to do? Well, think about it. Is volume changing according to time? Is the radius changing according to time? Is the height changing according to time? All of those things are then functions of t, functions of time. Just like y was a function of x in our earlier implicit differentiation problems, all of these are now functions, well pi over 3 is not, that's a constant, but h and r and v are all functions in terms of time. So we can do that, but you just have to be careful, because since these are all functions of time, do you remember that when y was a function of x, you had to take a, and put a dy dx after everything? Because it was a function of x. Now every one of these variables is a function of time. So we're going to have a d whatever dt after every one of them because they're all implicit functions of time. Notice how n none of these are solved for t, right? I can't say h equals this t, v equals this t. R, I can't say that. So I can't solve them for t explicitly, so I have to treat them implicitly, just like we did in the previous examples. You're going to see this in just a moment. So we can do this because v, r, and t, I'm sorry, v, r, and uh, h, sorry are all functions of time. So we're lucky that implicit differentiation was such a good lead-in to this. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and do that. We'll take the derivative implicitly of, the, of both sides. So when we took an implicit different, uh, derivative, we did a d, d something of both sides to start off with, right? So this would be a d, 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 d what? T. T. Why T? Yeah. What d, d, t stands for is a derivative with respect to time, or in other words, it gives you the, listen carefully, the rate of change according to the time. Does that make sense? The related rate, the rate of change, the related rate of change, because a derivative is a rate of change, according to the time. So d, d, t, sure, of the volume equals, equals, well, ddt of that entire right-hand side as well. Let's start with the easy side. Easy side is the left-hand side. What is uh, ddt of v? What's it, remember, v is just a, a single variable. What's the derivative of v? It would be one, but then you have the chain rule. Why do you have the chain rule here? Is v a function of t? Yeah. So just like y was a function of x and you did a dy dx, v is a function of t. So look what this says. This says the derivative of v with respect to t. This says the derivative of v with respect to t. v is a function of t. So you have to have that. It's implicit. It's the implicit way to write, oh, sorry, it's, it's stating that v is a function of t. You have to have the dvdt. Here's what this says in English. This says, this is how the volume is changing with respect to time. That's the rate of change of the volume. Does that make sense to you? 
you see why we need that DBDT? It is an implicit derivative. Now on the right hand side, uh, oh, what now? Oh, explain why I need the product rule. Because you have two separate uh, functions. Okay, so what are my variables over here? Are each of those a function in terms of t? Yes, I said all of them were. So if we're taking this with respect to t, that's a function in terms of t, that's a function in terms of t, and they're being multiplied. That means a product rule. How many people see the product rule up there? Okay, let's do it. Mom, you set the product rule. Um, you can do it one of two ways. You can take the pi over 3 out, or you can associate it with one of the variables. It really doesn't matter. I think I took it out. I don't, I don't know why, but it really doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, let's see. When you do this first derivative, this part's going to give you 2r, 2r. What else do I need besides the 2r? Oh, besides the h. I need dr dt. Did you guys all have dr dt? It's implicit, so you have to have not only 2r, but and not only the h, but you're going to get a, actually, you know what, I'll write this way so you see it. This gives you the 2r dr dt times h. That's this piece right here. That's what that gives you. Then the plus, this is going to give you r squared. Sure. What's the dh dt? What's that going to give you? There's dh dt. Show of hands, how many people got 2r dr dt and then h and then the r squared dh dt? Do you all get that as well? So if we pretty this up just a little teeny bit, I'll probably put the h in front of the dr dt just because that's like that's how we like to write it. So 2rh dr dt plus r squared dh dt. Now, if you didn't pull out the pi over 3, you have a pi over 3 here and you have a 2 pi over 3 there. Is it any different? No, it's the same thing. What I really want to you look at, we're not going to actually do an example of this one. I wanted you to get this idea down. But here's, the, here's what we would have to know in order to figure this out. If I said, what's the, how is the volume changing, or what's the rate of change of the volume at, hmm, and inserted this, this question to you, I'd have to give you a lot of information. You see, we would have to know not only the R at that time, not only the H at that time, not only the D, we need to know the DRDT. So we'd have the r, we'd have the r, that's the radius. We'd have the h, we'd have the height. But we'd also need to know, well, we need to know dr dt. What is dr dt? Sure, but what's it mean? The change in the radius over time. The, the, how the radius is changing with respect to time. Does that make sense? It'll either be growing or falling, depending on whether we're putting water in or taking water out. Uh, but the, the radius will be growing or, or shrinking. So we need to know the rate at which it's changing for a moment of time. We need to know that. That will tell us how the volume is changing in a moment of time. We'd also need to know DHDT. What's DHDT stand for? Yeah, how the height of our water is changing with respect to time. Is it going up? Is it going down? What's happening to that? We need to know all of those pieces, what the radius is currently, what the height is currently. That would give us the actual volume. But to associate how the volume is changing, that's where we need the change in the radius and the change in the height. How people kind of understand the concept of our, our DHDT? Uh, related rates. 
Now, we're going to go a little step backwards and kind of start simply, and we're going to build up to problems like this. Are you ready for it? But if you understand this, you understand the concept. So let's start off real simple. Well, I'm not even going to give you any, any background on this. I'm just say here's an equation. dy dt, and here's what this implies, it implies that y and x are both functions in terms of t, just like this was. Okay, it implies that y is changing according to time and x is changing according to time. Are you with me on this? So they're functions in terms of t. At t equals 1. Why don't you go ahead and do this real quick for me? Take an implicit derivative, because this has to be implicit. Y and X are in terms of T right now. It's got to be implicit. Take an implicit derivative with respect to T right now for me. There's no hard product rule. There's nothing about this. So d dt of y equals d dt of x cubed. Notice we're, we're taking to respect to t because we want to figure out what happens here at dy dt and at t equals 1. So uh, what's this side going to become for you? <coughs> On the right-hand side, I get 3x squared, right? And that's it? Dx dt. Why dx dt? Look at it. Look at, I know we have an x up here, but are you taking it with respect to x? No, you're not. You're taking it with respect to t, implying that x is a function of t. So unless there's an x there, you have to have something after that. Just like we had a dx of y, we had to have that dy dx, right? It was in terms of x. So this says, I need a dx dt. Show of hands how many will have that. Good, you understand the implicit form of this. And that's what that means. So let's go ahead and let's figure out what happens at t equals 1. Oh, crap. Where do I plug in the t? Is there a t to plug in? By the way, you can't plug in. can't plug that in. <laughs> D1. <laughs> I sunk your battleship. That's what that means. Uh, no, there's... Did you get it? That was funny. Uh, no, there's no, there's no t to plug in. So if I give this problem to you, I have to give you more things. I have to give you stuff. I would have had to give you all this stuff, right? It has to be given somewhere in the problem. So here's what I'm going to say. Find this out if if x equals 2 and dx dt equals 4 at t equals 1. At t equals 1. Note something, please. x and dx dt will change for certain times. So at t equals 2, this will no longer be the case. But look what I've given you. I said find it at t equals 1. Oh, what's happening at t equals 1? I've also given you that information. Does that make sense to you? So I've given, it matches up. I've given you the piece for that. So why does it say t equals 1 and t equals 1? It says find this at t equals 1, yes. But then I have to tell you what happens at t equals 1. I can't just give these to you unless I define t equals 1 either because those things will change for other times. Now do you have enough information to plug this in? You've got an x, you've got an x. You've got a dx dt, ah, I have the rate of change of x according to time. That means you can plug in the numbers and figure this out. So this would be... What is it? 48. 48 units according to whatever time, like seconds or hours, according to whatever t is. What does this mean? This means that y is changing at a rate of 48 whatevers per unit of time. That's what that says. You okay with this? Cool. All right. Let's intensify the problem just a little bit. So next thing we're going to talk about. Have you guys ever heard of the Exxon Valdez? Yes. 
What did it do? Oh, oil spill. Yeah, and oil is crazy, right? Because it usually sticks on the surface of water and just starts expanding. Just keeps on expanding. Now we're going to do kind of a simplified problem. You see in the ocean there's, there's current and there's drift and there's waves and stuff. We're going to do a simplified Exxon Valdez. What we're going to say is that this, this small, it's a small tanker, so I can be, we're simplifying the problem here. Uh, it started leaking oil, and what it's going to do is give us a radius that's spreading at a certain rate. Uh, we want to find out how fast the area is increasing at a certain radius. So we want to be able to calculate, model, uh, what the, the surface area of this, this oil spill is actually going to be. Do you understand the, the question here? So we'll, uh, let me write this out for you real quick. Oh, by the way, any questions on this one? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Oil spill. Here's what we know. Radius is spreading at a constant three feet per second. This is one of two cases because naturally, if you think about an oil spill, the radius should actually slow down, right? I, I, I mean, because that area is getting massive after a certain amount of time, so the radius should actually slow down spreading. So one of two things is happening: either this is for a very small oil spill right at the beginning, or for a certain segment of time, which that could be the case, or an instant of time, or the oil is pumping out more and more and more and more. Okay, so you start with a little spill and then you get more. But in, in, in any case, we're saying the radius of this circle of oil is a constantly, it, it, the radius is growing constantly. Okay, so a constant three feet per second. Do you see why that would probably not be realistic unless you have a massive amount of oil that starts real small and then really grows? Do you see that? Because, I mean, three feet a second, like here's your, your first circle and then after one second, uh, it is now three feet more, so can't even do that. Okay, big. And after another second. So probably over a certain segment of time. What we want to know is how fast is the area increasing when the radius is 30 feet? How fast is radius increasing when, I'm sorry, how fast is the area increasing when the radius is 30? Here's what you do first. Number one, you assign some letters to take care of these things. So, firstly, we need this according to time, so we're going to put T for time. <coughs> what other things do we need to know about, about this? Area. What now? Area. area. So let's pick A for area. Okay. What else do we need to know about this? Radius. Well, that's our ultimate question, right? But I mean just the variables that we're dealing with. Radius. We have a radius, so R for radius. So the first part really shouldn't be that big of a deal. Just pick out some some letters. So T is going to be your time. In our case, we only have two of the things that are happening. We have a radius and we have an area. That's it. Are you guys okay with the letters? Next thing you got to do, after you assign your letters, identify the formula that you're doing. So this is step one. Step one is pick your letters. Step two is you got to identify what formula you're dealing with. And it should be given up there somewhere. It should have some relationship that relates all of your letters or everything except for T. It should have that. So what are we talking about here that's going to relate our area and our radius? That's what we really want to do. Because the T is going to take care of itself when we find a derivative. We want to relate an area and a radius. Can you find, think of a formula that relates to that? Yeah, it's a circle, right? 
the circle. So in this case, our formula is not very hard. It just says, can you relate everything up here? And that's the idea of a related rate. It says, relate these, these items I want to compare. And so for us, sure, I have an area and a radius. Let's relate the area of a circle and the radius. Well, that just says area equals pi r squared. That's what we're talking about. You okay with this so far? Now, dA dt is going to come about this, but that's what we're asking. Uh, how fast is the area increasing? That's going to be this dA dt. What else are we going to get up here? Do you see the dr dt coming about? So every variable you're going to get that. dA dt is the rate of change of area according to time, of course. And we're also going to get a dr dt. Now, your problem is not going to give you specifically what dr dt is. And I can say dr dt is this, but it would be worded in such a way that you should be able to understand it. What does dr dt mean? Change in the radius. Good, good. It means a change in radius. A d, whatever, that's the change in, the change in radius. By the way, um, do you know what dr dt is going to equal for our specific problem right here? It should say in the word problem. This says the rate of change of the radius. What's the rate of change, the rate of change of our radius? Is it 30? No. That is the radius. What is the rate of change of the radius? Said, it should be how the radius is changing. I'll put it up there somewhere. It says the radius is spreading. Oh, it's changing at a constant of 3 feet a second. So our radius here is changing at a rate of 3 feet per second. Do you understand how to get the dr dt and, and, and identify that that's 3 in this case? So it says the rate is changing. Hey, that's a rate of change. That's what we're talking about. Now, after this, we're almost done. The only thing that we've got to do now, step number three, take a derivative with respect to time, implicitly, because they're all functions of time. And then lastly, plug in the values and you'll have it. So here's what we're going to do. We'll do it very quickly. We're going to take d dt of a. We're going to take d dt, function of time, of pi r squared. There's no tricky rules involved here. This is going to be d a dt. On the right-hand side, we have 2 pi r dr dt. Do you see where we're getting the 2 pi r? Explain to me why I don't have a product rule between my pi and my r. Why not? Pi is actually not a variable. Yeah, it's constant. So this says bring down the 2, great. Subtract 1 from the next one, got it. But I need a dr dt. Do you see why I need a dr dt? I've got to be able to incorporate this information somewhere. Do I need to plug anything for dA dt? No, that's my question. That's what I have over here. So you're going to have everything plugged in except for the main thing you're looking for. In our case, we want just dA dt. You have to have all the other information plugged in. Are you with me still so far? Do I have everything else? Do I have an R? What does it say my R is at this certain time? So when, when this time comes about, my radius is 30. I don't even care what the time is, do I? I don't even care. My radius is 30. Do I have a dr dt? 3. So we're going to have 2 pi times 30 times 3 feet per second. In fact, I'll use the unit so you see it. 30 feet, right? 30 feet times 3 feet per second. Why am I showing you this? Well, we should end in an area, right? Can I say the area is increasing at 15 feet per second? No, because that would be linear. Area should be in square feet, right? Are we going to get square feet? Absolutely. So we're going to get, oh, what is that? 180? What we've just found out is that for this specific oil spill, our area is increasing. When our radius is 30 feet, our area is increasing at 180, unless I did that wrong. Oh, I forgot my pi. That's important. 
Yeah. That's, that's a factor of 3.141592. <laughs> Is that an okay answer? Or do you have the decimal? This is great. Yeah. Now, if, you, if it asks, it could give you something more realistic than back in book, but this is exact. A pi would give you approximation. It says that multiply 180 times pi. That's how much a square footage is increasing per second at this exact moment in time, and that's what we're talking about. Do you guys understand the idea of related rates? We're going to try maybe one or two next time, not a whole lot, because this is basically the idea. It's an implicit derivative, just with respect to time. The problem's going to give you everything else. All right, our last related rates problem. Here's the idea behind this problem and behind every related rates problem. Basically, we're trying to relate a formula that has all of our piece of information together, and we're trying to relate it to time. So we're taking derivatives with respect to time in order to figure out rates of change. And that's our, our whole idea, rates of change with respect to time. So in our problem here, here's what's going on. You're launching a rocket from the ground, and you're going to televise it. So what you want is this automated camera. And you're going to set it up at ground level, and you want to make some computer program that's going to watch it. It's a very sturdy camera. Have you ever seen the people watching rockets and they've all zoomed in? It's like, looks like crap. But <laughs> right? you don't want to be that guy. So you're like, well, you know, we're math dorks. So you want to set up this automated thing that's going to go, and, and the angle is going to be perfect to keep that rocket centered in its graphic the whole entire time. You get the idea? That's the plan. So what we want to do is, if this rocket is climbing at 600 feet per second when the rocket's at 4,000 feet, how fast will the angle of elevation have to change at 4,000 feet to keep up the rocket? Well, now here's the deal. When we start out, this distance is going to be fixed. And let's say that we're 3,000 feet away from the rocket. So our camera's not going to move, and the rocket <coughs> is going straight up. Do you get the idea? Now, because we have this rocket's height, the rocket's height is going to be changing. Are you with me on that? So we can't just call this 4,000 right now. We do have to call it h, because that is a variable that's going to be changing throughout the problem. So our rocket's way up here. I don't know how to draw a rocket. Uh, rocket. That looks like an arrow. I don't know. Rocket. Whatever. <laughs> I'm close to a rocket. It's a flying arrow. I'm going to be a math dork. OK, so we've got this. This rocket flying, it's going to be h feet high. We're going to figure out when h is 4,000 what we're going to be doing on this. But when we, when we come up with our, our problem here, I told you there's a few things we need to do. The first thing we've got to do, assign some letters. Assign some letters to what we're, we're working with. So, of course, we like to have, what, what's one thing that we're, we're going to be relating? Time. time is definitely one of them. So, t for time. What's another letter that we might use? Good. Height, H, we've already have that on there. So H for height. Anything else that we need? We have the time. We've got the height. There's one more relationship up there. Was it? Not acceleration. The what? The angle of the television. So we have to have something to do with the angle of this. Let's see if we've related everything in our problem. Here's where you read through your problem carefully, okay? If we've missed anything, if we left anything out, then we haven't assigned enough letters. A rocket's climbing at 600 feet per second. When the rocket is at 4,000 feet, that's a height. We have something for height. How fast is the angle of, ele oh, angle of elevation? That's our angle, so we needed to have that. How fast will the angle of elevation have to change? That fast, that's a rate of change. So we need something to do with time. So we have our time up there, we have our angle up there, we have our height up there. Okay, this is back to our height. So we have all the letters that we're going to need right here. Are you with me on this? Now, we don't necessarily have to have a T in the formula we're about to write because we're going to take a derivative with respect to T. We don't need the T, but everything else must be related. That means I'm going to have to have a formula that relates the height and the angle. Does that make sense? So if I call this my angle, my angle of elevation, if I call that my angle, I need a formula that relates height and angle. I, I need to have that. Is it Pythagorean theorem? Because you know what a lot of people do, they go, oh, right triangle, Pythagorean theorem. That covers everything. Does that cover everything? No. That relates this and this and that. 
but it doesn't relate to angle, which is our main question, right? So if you use Pythagorean theorem, sure, you can come up with a formula. And sure, you can work some of it out, but it's not going to have the angle relationship that we are looking for. Are you with me on this? So, can you tell me what incorporates an angle with this? What is that? Inverse. It doesn't have to be an inverse. It doesn't have to be solved for theta. It just has to have theta in it. It just have to has to have the height in it. Okay. Tan. Tan would do it. Tan is opposite over hypotenuse. Yes. No, it's not. Opposite over adjacent, yeah. What is opposite over hypotenuse? What's adjacent over hypotenuse? I'm, I'm you. I got you. Yes, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So does our, does our tangent of theta have to do with the material that we have on the board right now? Are you seeing where I'm getting that from? So tan theta... <coughs> Equals, okay, what was it again? What over what? Which is specifically in this case what? <coughs> Does that relate everything we wanted to relate? Does it relate the angle and the height, basically, is what you're asking? Yes. Are you okay on where that's coming from? You've got to have an angle down there somewhere that's typically dealing with some trigonometry. If it doesn't involve an angle, you probably don't have to use trigonometry. But this one, we certainly do. Now, the next thing after we assigned our letters and we made our, our formula was what? What did we do? Okay, so we took a derivative of the time. Actually, before that, we identified any rates of change. Uh, that's what we did as well. So let's identify any rates of change that we have. Can you read any rates of change right here? Any rates of change? That's a rate of change, sure. What is changing at 600 feet per second? Is it the angle, the height, or the time? What is it? The height. Here's how you write that. If your height is changing with respect to time at 600 feet per second, what would the change in height compared to time be? What is that? DHDT. Yeah, DHDT. That works. This is the change in height with respect to time, and you know that 600 feet per second. Actually, we'll get a little bit more fancy. Is it a constant 600 feet per second? It doesn't say that. So this is specifically at 4,000 feet. So it's defined at 4,000 feet that it's climbing at 600 feet per second. Uh, rockets, when you have a, a source of propellant, they don't climb at the same rate. Typically, those, those rockets that take off from the ground increase speed and increase speed and increase speed and keep going and going until they reach their escape velocity and find that they're gone. Does that make sense? So right here, at this 4,000 feet mark, we're increasing at 600 feet per second. That's our, our change in height compared to time. H is 4,000, right? The height at, at when H is 4,000. Yeah, exactly right. When H is 4,000. Let's go ahead and let's try to find this. What we're looking for is, okay, well, we want one more thing. How fast will the angle of elevation change? That means, how can I write how fast will the angle of elevation change? What is that? D theta dt. That's the change in the angle compared to time. Does that make sense to you? The change in the angle, this is how fast will the angle of elevation have to change. That's the change in the angle compared to the time at 4,000 feet. This is what we're looking for, right there. I'm going to kind of recap just a little bit to hopefully one more time go through this with you. So what we do, usually you're going to have a picture, something to do with the picture. Here we have a triangle because we're launching a rocket and we have this angle of elevation where the camera's watching the rocket go up. Just hopefully nice and keep it centered in the, in the camera space. Are you with me on this? So we identify everything that we need to do. We have our height, we have our angle, we have our time. That's fine. Come up with a formula that relates those things. That's really on you guys. The formulas usually aren't, aren't horribly, horribly bad. But you've got to find one that works for you. In our case, we know that tangent of theta is height over 3,000. 3,000 was a constant. H, that's our, one of our variables we need to relate. So that does it for us. Then we go ahead and we, we identify what our rates of change are. The height is going to be changing at 600 feet per second. This is the change in height compared to time, 600 feet per second. What we're looking for is the change in angle, right there, the change in angle with respect to time. Both of them have to occur when the height is 4,000 feet. 
because we want to. We, maybe that's our, our marker we want to make in our computer program. That's an important place for us. I don't know. I don't do computer programming, but maybe that would be important for this particular one. What do you do now? What do you do now? We have our letters assigned. We have all our rates of change. Rates of change done, and we're looking for this thing. We have our formula. What do you do to this formula? What are you going to do? Take the derivative. Yeah, take the derivative. Let's go ahead. Let's take a derivative of this. Take a derivative of that with respect to what? Let's do it with respect to time. So this is implicit differentiation with respect to time. Go ahead and do that real quick. Or at least you can start on it. Um, here maybe as a hint for you, if you're struggling with the h over 3,000, you could write this as 1, 3,000 h. So make things a little bit nicer. <coughs> really wouldn't matter all that much, but you could do that. You can do that as well. That'd be fine. Um, now, before we get going, I didn't get a whole lot of enthusiasm on this side of the board. Are there any questions over here? Are you okay that we had to identify H and theta and T? No? Yes. You sure? Are you okay on seeing where the tan theta equals H over 3,000 comes from? By the way, the reason why we get this, the reason why we do this ahead of time, is because this is going to be part of our problem. You're going to have a d variable over dt for every variable that you have. So when we have h and we have theta, you're going to have a d theta dt. In fact, that's what we're counting on. That's what we're counting on, because that's what we're solving for. And But you're also going to have a dh dt. So you need to be able to identify that, and that's what we were looking for. So that's why I have a dh dt right here. That's why I know I'm looking for a d theta dt. You're going to have one of those for every variable that you have. Because it's all implicit. It's, they're all functions of t. But you're going to feel okay with what we're talking about so far. All right, good. Now, hopefully you made it just past this. Just past this would be, okay, let's take the derivative of tangent theta with respect to t. Keep in mind, this is a chain rule every time because it's with respect to t. So the derivative of tangent is what? Sigma squared. Sigma squared what? Theta. Good. Theta. And then, is that it? Because you touched the theta with a derivative, you have to have d theta dt. So far, so good? All right. Uh, now, other side. What is 1 3 thousandths h when I take a derivative of that? The constant's there still. Good. Why the h dt? Because it's in respect to time. Okay, so h is a function in terms of time, so you absolutely must have a dh dt. Hey, by a show of hands, how many people got that? Good. If you didn't get that, and that some of you didn't raise your hand, if you didn't get that, are you okay on getting secant squared theta d theta dt? You see where that comes from? You every time you take a, a function of of theta with respect to time, you got to have a d theta dt. Are you okay on the 1 over 3,000? That h that's, that has an exponent of 1, bring down the 1, take 1 away from it, that becomes that h to the 0, that's 1. But you need a dh dt, that's a must. You okay with this so far? All right. Well, now we're, we're pretty much almost done when you think about it. Which piece are we ultimately looking for? This is, this is not what we're looking for. We're actually not even looking for the theta because that's the angle. We're looking for the change of the angle over time. We're looking for this piece. How fast is the angle changing over time? You follow me? 
at uh, when it's 4,000 feet. This is a constant, and that we have a relationship at 4,000 feet. You with me so far? Okay. So this one's going to be easy. We already have that. This one might take a little bit more work. Let's talk about secant squared theta for a second. First thing I need you to understand is that secant squared theta really means sec not that. Being secant theta squared. Keep in mind this is all occurring at 4,000 feet. So let's go back over to our, our picture here and kind of fill in this, the blanks a little bit. This is 3,000. This H at a specific time will be how much are we looking at? 4,000. That's going to be 4,000 at the moment of time that we're looking at. You follow me on this? That's going to be 4,000. Someone who knows something about Pythagorean triples. Tell me if this is 3,000, 4,000. Very good. If it wasn't 3,000 or 4,000, you'd have to do Pythagorean theorem to figure out that distance. By the way, the reason why we're figuring out that distance is because we have to now find what secant theta is. Secant, what is secant? Uh, one over cosine. So if you found cosine here and just reciprocated, you would get secant. Are you with me on this? So let's go ahead, let's talk about what cosine is. What's cosine of my angle theta? What's cosine? Oh, come on, don't leave me hanging. What's cosine here? Good, specifically, what's cosine? 3,000 over 5,000. 3,000 over 5,000? Therefore, secant is 5,000 over 3,000. Does that make sense to you? 1 over cosine, right? So secant would be reciprocate the fraction, you're going to get instead of 3,000 over 5,000, secant theta will be 5,000 over 3,000. Or 5 over 3. Or 5 over 3. Don't forget that you're squaring it. okay with this so far, folks? Do you see where the 5,000 or 3,000 is coming from? Do you see where the squared is coming from? Now, I'm missing something. Let's do the dhdt right now as well. How much is the dhdt that we were talking about? Because when we're at 4,000 feet, we're saying, okay, now we're 4,000, give me the rate of change of height with respect to time, and that's what this is saying. What's the rate of change of height with respect to time? What, what did we mark that out as? Let's make this a little bit prettier. Can we do that? Let's make it pretty. What happens over here, 5,000 over 3,000? I love that. That's nice. So I'm going to get 5 thirds squared. Over here, we're going to get 25 over 9, you do what? Say what? Okay, very good. So if I multiply by 9 25ths on both sides,
I'm going to get one, the 9 over 125. And keep in mind, all this happened when the height was 4,000. That's how we came up with our secant. That's how we came up with this thing as well. So it was dependent on that height. Are you following me on that? The 600 feet per second only worked for a height of 4,000. The secant theta only works for a height of 4,000. That's the specific distance we were at, specific height. So that was when the height was 4,000. I know that's small up there. I'm kind of, I don't want to write it too big to let it take over the problem. I'll write it so you can see it, 4,000. What now? Can you tell me what we just found? Rate of Slope, sure, but in this context, it's a rate of change. A, a derivative is a rate of change. So this derivative says the rate of change of the angle with respect to time. How fast the angle must change in that moment of time, in this specific moment of time, to keep up with the rocket. Are you following that? So how fast the angle must grow in order to keep up with the rocket at that moment. Before that, maybe quicker. After that, maybe slower. But in that moment, that's how fast it needs to be climbing in that instant of time. Rich, you have to understand the idea. Okay, now let's make this a little bit, a little bit more easy to understand. Do that division. How much do you get? Don't all talk at once here. 0.72 or something like that. Yeah, 0 0.072, this right here, which you just gave me, is going to be in radians per second. Radians per second. Could you please translate that into degrees? So, because we typically, if I say 0 0.72 radians per second, you really can't grasp that, can you? It's hard for us because we don't really deal with radians all that much. Translate that into degrees for me. That means you'll multiply by 180 and you'll divide by pi. Multiply by 180, divide by pi, you get 4. 4.125. It carries on. 4.13? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. Degrees. 0 0.72 radians is 4.13 degrees per second. Is that more understandable? Four degrees? So at this moment of time, so the rocket takes off, right? Climbing 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, gets to 4,000 feet. That camera better be keeping up with it at a, at a growing, increasing rate of 4.13 degrees per second. So it's got to climb four degrees in that one second. At that moment of time, now it's not giving you a passable second, but at that moment, it's climbing at a rate of 4.13 degrees per second. Do you guys understand the idea? Is the math all that hard? Not really. This is probably the hardest part right there. And that's what's going to be hard for you is coming up with a formula. Figuring out how to relate these pieces together. <clears throat> After that, look what you're doing. You're just taking implicit derivative. You're just driving it, making sure you have a d variable over dt for every variable you have. The, everything else will be given to you. If not, you can find it with your relationship. And then plug the numbers in, and it'll work itself out. Um, any questions on what we've talked about so far? Do you understand what we've talked about so far? I've been doing all the talking today, so mm -hmm. any questions before we continue? So we deal. The next thing we get to talk about is chapter 3. Well, we're going to skip section 2.9 for right now. We might come back to it. It's called differentials and linear approximation uh, at the end of our, our class. I hope it will be.